Welcome to Momversations. I am your host, Reagan Barnes, and I am a mom of eight and founder of Mom of Eight. We are a nonprofit organization that empowers you to elevate your mothering experience. Also joining us today, right here next to me, is a member of the Mom of Eight team, Christina Johnson, who is a self-described food person. And you, Mom, you are joining us, and we are so glad to have you both, uh, Christina and you too. We welcome you into the Mom of Eight community, or Mom Unity, as we like to say. We're moms united in our passion to create a better world for our children, with our children, and through our children. Join us and become a mom, a Mom Unity member. It's free on our website, momofeight.org. And when you join our mom unity, we'll send you a free digital copy of our smile journal where you can keep track of what you learn from each of these mom conversations and set goals to impact your personal achievement based on this educational program. So let's get this mom conversation started. Here at Mom of Eight, we answer the question, what do moms do? With this uplifting statement, moms raise up society. That's right, not just our own kids, but all of society, including ourselves. This acronym is jam-packed with the far-reaching impact of intentional mothers who strive to improve and progress in these areas of motherhood. We're not just chauffeurs and short order cooks, but as we repeatedly do bedtime routine and load after load after load of laundry, it makes an impact that goes beyond our homes because as moms, we are uniquely positioned to um, influence society one child at a time. Um, so thankfully, we're grateful for our jobs, and, but it is repetitive, loving work. It shapes our children and it shapes us too. Uh, today with Christina, we're going to focus on the category of atmosphere and get even more specific and dig into the subcategory of taste. At Mom of Eight, we know that part of motherhood includes creating a home atmosphere, and we explore this centuries-old art of homemaking through this lens of the five senses. And today we'll hone in, we'll narrow down and focus in on taste. So Welcome, Christina. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Um, well, let's see. I'm a mom of three, and I am currently staying home with my kids full time, which has been really, really fun. And well, I guess working with mom of eight and doing things like that. But um, yeah, and I'm I I really love food. I've loved food my whole life. My my family's been into that for years, and that's been one of the things that I found about motherhood that has been really joyful for me because I've been able to share that with my kids, share that with my husband, and kind of make that something that I can do a lot about, um, kind of dig into as a mother, right? Right. Awesome. Um, let's see. I think with motherhood and this fact that our children are hungry three times a day at least, <laughs> it can get really overwhelming. And, and sometimes you're just caught up in that feeling of, am I doing enough? Um, how can we kind of work through those feelings? That's a great question. I feel like that that is such a struggle because there are so many images that we get and kind of stories that we're told about how mothers are, right? And there are a lot of those stories around the kitchen. <laughs> and, and so we, it can be really easy to feel like you're just not doing enough. And I think the, the first thing that we need to keep in our mind, you know, above everything else that we're going to be talking about today is that you keep your kids fed. And that's really the goal. Like no matter yeah. what you're doing, you're doing enough because you're feeding your children. And that, that is really what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but I, I hope that we can go into some things that can make that a more enjoyable and more fulfilling experience, um, for all of you as you're in, in that journey. Oh, that's a really great thing. I think you're starting where we are and being able to accept that place, you know, and, and then, and then add in the joy and the, 
Uh, so what is it that makes you so passionate about nice. how we feed our children and, and uh, that, that I love that you call it a food culture. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, well, we create a culture in our homes, right? With the way that we talk to our children and the way that we choose to interact. Um, and I think choosing how we want that to be is one of the wonderful things that we get to do as mothers and as parents and, you know, and I think with food, there's just so much mess that can go on in our heads, you know it's what I mean? Really right. There's so much noise that can kind of distract us from the self fact that like when we were young, at least when you were really young, you know, I think everybody can remember a time when food was just a joyful thing for them, right? right. It's like this incredible thing. Our bodies feel pleasure when we eat, which is something we have to do. Like, how <laughs> cool is that? But I think all of this noise gets in the way, you know? So when I was younger, when I was in high school, I had an eating disorder for a number of years um, because I was hearing a lot of noise from friends and from, you know, kind of the overarching culture. Yeah. Um, even though I grew up with parents that taught me really great things about food and that took away my, my food joy for a while, right? I also, after I got married, I started having issues with a hormone disorder that I have. I gained a bunch of weight and had doctors telling me, well, you'll get pregnant as soon as you lose weight. And that took away a lot of joy from food, you know? Oh, that's rough. And so I think I, I realized that this, this relationship with food can be so complicated and so emotional. Um, but as I've kind of worked through that, I have found a lot of joy in just saying, you know what, I'm going to choose the way that I think about food. I'm going to choose to think a certain way about how I nourish my body and how I feel about my body and kind of disconnect that so that it doesn't need to be, food doesn't need to be about the way that I look <laughs> at all. And it doesn't need to be about the way that I kind of interact with society. It can just be something that I can experience as an adventure. And Ooh, that's kind nice. of how I like to think about it. Yeah. And so, I think, you know, maybe because I've had such complicated relationships with it in the past, it's been a real goal for me to really focus on figuring out how I want to think about it and creating that culture for my children. Oh, that is a rich past that you have. I think that's very um, ideal for you to share about having an eating disorder and then share the concept of the hormonal disorder and how some of those things just feel so outside of our control. And yet you have ultimately learned how, and it sounds like it's all through your thoughts. It's all about how you choose to think about things. I'm really big on that. I'm a bit of a stoic. I like to believe yeah. that we get to choose how we feel about things because we get to choose the thoughts we think about them. And we get to, we have power over the stories that we tell ourselves about our own lives. And those stories are part of that culture concept also. Exactly. A culture can include, and, and uh, very much based on stories. I, I know in the past, as I've tried to become interactive with other cultures, a lot of that is about the stories that are told and, and the history and things like that. So, so let's take that concept of culture and figure out what that means about food, food yeah. culture. What's a family food culture? That's a great question. So I feel like, um, there's, there's a lot of things that my family, that I like to, to talk about with my children that start to create our food culture. So the first thing that is very important to me as I'm talking to my children is that food is not good or bad. No food is bad. No food is just good, but rather every food is healthy in the right amount. And, um, you know, we'll talk about reasonable amounts of certain foods, right? And particularly about how those foods would make us feel. Okay. I like to talk to my children about being mindful, you know. Oh, I love that. How word. mindful, the mindfulness. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you think your kids can't get that? They totally can. My seven-year-old has the the wherewithal to go, oh, you know, when I say, when she says, Can I have another bowl of ice cream? I'll say, Okay, well, how's your stomach feeling? Mm. And she will sometimes be like, mm, I better not. And then yeah. sometimes she'll say, I can eat a little more. <laughs> and I think that that, that gives her that power back to her and also allows her to not think about food as a moral thing, which I think is a huge problem. I had a friend a number of years ago, who's a nutritionist and she was the one that first introduced me to this idea because it was her thesis was the idea that people wow. think about food decisions as moral decisions. <laughs> and she thought that was really dangerous. And I agree. Mm -hmm. Food is not a moral choice. It is not bad 
or wrong or naughty to eat something. It is also not righteous to eat something. It's just the that's, food we choose to eat. That's a really good point. Cause I do actually sometimes feel very virtuous when I'm eating my vegetables. <laughs> Yeah. And I think actually that causes a problem both ways. Yeah. We can't enjoy our vegetables as much because we're so busy making them virtuous (laughs) and we can't enjoy our ice cream as much because we're so busy feeling guilty about it, but every food is healthy in the right amount. I think that's a great way to, to specify is it's not about whether it's a high calorie or keto or whatever those, we have so many um, ways that we categorize our foods, but maybe it's really more about the amounts. Yeah, it's more more about moderation, I feel like. And I think particularly because we live in a culture that is so fat phobic, we (laughs) worry a lot about food making us larger than we think we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But I've seen it go both ways, right? I've seen a lot of situations with eating disorders and and there is um, even a new eating disorder that's been categorized by the American Psychological Association that basically centers around obsessive healthy eating. Which is, I have seen beca- cause people to be so underweight that it causes health problems. You might think that's not a thing. It is totally oh, oh, happening. Yeah. Oh, I, I can see. And, um, and even if it's not a matter of them becoming underweight, the obsessiveness can be the thing. Oh, it's the, incredibly The unhealthy. fact that it will um, define what they do with each minute of their day. And, and even relationships can be ruined because of that obsessiveness. And Definitely. So I think that's great that they've actually figured that out and categorized it as a, as a problem. Cause it is. And I've seen this cause real problems for people in their lives. And so I feel like balancing those two things and saying, okay, yes, I want to eat healthy. I want to eat in ways that make my body able to do the things I want it to do. I want my body to feel good, but I also don't want that to kick over my life. And I don't want that to be causing other issues for me. So I have to be moderate in everything that I choose to do around food. And I feel like that can create a relationship where we can make wise decisions, but they're not shame-based decisions. Yeah, They're not decisions that feel restrictive to us because instead we're just saying, hey, this is how I want to treat my body. So generally I'm going to do this, but if today that's not what happened, tomorrow it'll be different. It's not supposed to be exact. Our bodies don't need perfect nutrition to run well. They need reasonable nutrition to run well. Right. I really like that. And that again, fits in with the moderation concept, not just in amount, but also in uh, the, the nutritional aspect is moderation is yeah, good. definitely. So then the other part of our food culture, that's really important to me that I think brings me joy more than anything is really that food is an adventure. And I am definitely an adventure seeker. This is something I gained from my parents. And I'm so grateful for the way that they brought this into my life because life can get kind of boring, right? I mean, life just kind of is the same every day. And as a mother, that can be even more true. I'm with my kids at home and we do the same things every day, but we can change the food that we're eating. And all of a sudden, you know, you're in a different country because you're eating something you've never eaten before. Or you're trying a new adventure because you're making something you've never attempted before. And it's just, I love to embrace that part of food, that it's a learning experience and it's always can be something new. Yeah. Um, And you can discover new things that bring you joy, right? So now I do want to ask about yeah. that though, because I, I don't know that kids are always that adventurous when it comes to food. <laughs> <laughs> you are definitely they're, right. They're often very interested in, I've tasted this before, so I can already decide yet whether I want to eat it or not. You know? Yes. And I think that's really natural, right? It, it would be dangerous for children historically have to have been going off when they were given a lot more freedom than we give them now and just eating whatever they found berries off a poisonous bush exactly so I think a lot of parents are shocked when at first their children are just eating whatever they give them and then all of a sudden you know at about 16 months Mm. 18 months they find their children get really picky well yeah your child just got a lot more independent Mm. and they're in a stage when that's dangerous um and I found that my children stay picky until, you know, three or four or five, they start to get a little bit less um, nervous about their food, what they're eating. But I also feel like there's a lot that we do that makes this process more difficult. Um, And so I, I think there's a lot to be said for taking an approach that makes this less of a struggle than it has to be. Right. Yeah. Um, And I think that we can include our children in that love of adventure. 
maybe simply um, tying back in what we said earlier about thoughts and how you're thinking about it. Maybe it's a matter of simply verbalizing those thoughts and helping our children hear what's going on inside our own heads with regards to, oh, isn't this fun and new food? And, and maybe they'll still, because it's in our DNA, go through that picky phase for the sake of safety, but they can eventually work through that because of your excitement about food. That's definitely true. So, you know, for example, um, last year at Chinese, oh, it wasn't, it was the moon festival. So my daughter's in a Chinese immersion school and she comes home from school and she goes, it's the Chinese moon festival today. We have to have a moon cake. So I decided, okay, we're just going to do this. So we pack into the car and we drive to the Chinese market around us and we look for moon cakes. And then I thought, okay, well, we need dinner. So I found a Korean noodle house that happens to be by us that, that has fairly authentic Korean food. Um, from, you know, my limited experience in Korea, I've only spent a week there, but you know, um, so we drive to the Korean noodle place and I get something and it definitely had some weird food in it. There was fungus in that. Ah, like mushrooms as in, or different um, than mushrooms? No, they're, they're like mushrooms. Yes. But you've probably never eaten them before. They're dark black kind of color and they're like, I don't know. Anyway, they're, they're not something you've probably eaten before. There are a couple <laughs> vegetables in there that my children had not seen before. Um, and then there was some, some shrimp and there was some different meats in it. Right. So, so kind of a, a new thing. They hadn't encountered a lot of these things before, right? but we took it outside in our backyard and we made a picnic and we made moon lanterns <gasps> and we sat down and we ate it. Yeah. My kids loved it. <laughs> because they weren't thinking about this as weird. They were thinking, what a cool experience are we having? They were thinking about the, the experience and they weren't busy thinking about maybe this is scary. Right. And so I How think, fun. and my kids aren't always like that. Some days they feel so adventurous. Some days they don't. And I think we need to allow them to be, you know, to have, we have those days too. Don't yes. you have days when you're just yes. like, all I want today is a burger and fries. Well, yeah. And that's why we have one of the categories is comfort food. Yeah. Those are the foods that we turn to in those moments of just, I need something familiar. I need some, you know, when we're pregnant, I think we tend to have a lot more of that um, natural need for certain things. Yeah. We well, and there's some biological support. impulse there too, yeah. right. To not eat things that could be dangerous. I, I totally understand. Cause I am usually a very adventurous eater, but when I'm pregnant, it's difficult for me. So I understand that. Interesting. Um, the other thing I think that we can remember when our children are struggling with picky eating is that our natural impulses may be to get really concerned about the fact that they're eating, not eating things that they were before, or they're not eating as much, mm -hmm. but the research would suggest that we actually need to calm down a little bit. Right. And I've heard this from many people that specialize in picky eating, that the first thing that they do in their job is tell the parents to relax, <laughs> which is hard. I understand. Um, but research, there's actually a recent study done just a couple of years ago out of University of Michigan um, that was published in pediatrics. And what it showed was that picky eating correlates with parents being restrictive in food choices parents being really demanding that they eat certain things or don't eat certain things or creating pressure to eat a certain amount. Right. So basically what that's saying, the finish the plate thing, yeah, or five more bites of your vegetable or something like that. Exactly. And it's not so much about how you choose. Like there's a lot of good ways to do this. There's no one right way to feed your children. Right. Um, but I think, yeah, we started off with that, right. Is yeah. that it's important that we're feeding them. Yes. Don't be too hard on ourselves. If we're feeding them, we're doing the right thing. Exactly. <laughs> but if you're having a struggle right now with a picky child and you're not sure what to do, my recommendation would be that the first thing you do is stop worrying so much that they're not going to get their nutrients. Cause that's the other thing that a lot of studies show is that picky children are not undernourished. Interesting. And so you might think your child's not getting enough. They will eat sufficient. Um, and your job is not to force them to eat the good foods. It's not to make sure that they're eating enough. They have biological imperatives that will take care of that. Okay. Your job is to continue providing good choices. Okay. Right. And I think a lot of this can be done behind the scenes. So okay. for example, in my home growing up, there weren't packaged cookies. My mom didn't buy those. If we wanted cookies, we could make them anytime, but we had to make them. So those were less available. Put the effort in. The effort was there. <laughs> on the other hand, 
if there were, if, if we wanted a snack, there was always whole wheat bread. There was always fruit and vegetables to snack on anytime you wanted, right? And so making those choices easier mm -hmm. certainly is a good idea, um, but, but we don't need to create a fight about it. We don't need to create a lot of stress around it. Instead, just saying, okay, I'm gonna pro provide good options. And, and then I'm going to lay back and let my children have, have a little bit more freedom. So personally, I never force my children to eat something. I never force my children to finish something okay. um, unless they insisted on dishing it. <laughs> uh -huh. That's a different situation. Um, <laughs> because you want to teach them not to waste. Exactly. And I think that also teaches them the mindfulness concept still, right? Because yeah. even when they're dishing it up, be mindful of about how much they can actually eat. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, you know, and we all get to choose how we do this. Um, but instead I just encourage them and I voice that they're feeling fear, which is what's causing them to not eat. Right. So when my child, when my child says, I don't want to eat that, it looks weird. I said, it's scary to try new food. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of bravery. Are you feeling brave today? Okay. And sometimes they're not, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. You know, but we can, we can kind of create a, an environment where they can choose to take some autonomy around it. And I think that they thrive a lot better in that environment. I love that. Yeah, I think that um, encompasses one of our principles here at Mama Vape. Um, when we teach these different parts of the Raise Up acronym, we have principles applied. And the concept of individual personality is one of ours, is recognizing that we are different people. We bring to the table, so yeah. to speak, <laughs> a lot of different things, including different taste buds. Um, and so figuring that out together as a family and respecting and validating these differences, I think it's a, a way to have a positive food culture as a family. Definitely. I think, I think that's the case. And, you know, something I make a, a point of is asking my children when I'm creating menus for the week, I say, mm -hmm. Hey, what do you want to eat? What do you want to eat? Right? right. That doesn't mean if they say I want mac and cheese, I serve mac and cheese and nothing else. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to put some veggies with it. Cause I want some veggies. I'm actually really obsessed with vegetables. They're delicious. You should all get on the vegetable train. They're amazing. But even if you're not, um, I try to provide those options. Right. Okay. And, but I can also give them a choice, the choice to say, Hey, you know, this week I want pizza. Great. I'll make pizza this week. I want, you know, whatever it is and giving them that that everybody in the family, some room yeah. to, to be a part of that, I think is helpful. It's, it's like buy-in almost, yeah, right? yeah. including them into that uh, planning stage. And I think too, it sets them up for when they're off on their own and they're having to put that thought into it. If mom always put the thought into it ahead of time, then they don't gain that skill um, necessarily. Totally. And as adults. Yeah. And you'd be surprised how often my kids ask for things that I'm like, Oh, that's not, that's a totally reasonable meal. I want stir fry, <laughs> yeah. you know, I want. And so that's I great. think they, they, they learn to love the food that you're creating. If you're, if you're consistently giving them good food. Right. Yeah. Awesome. I have a 12 year old who uh, is my son. So he, um, he is in charge of making dinner while I'm here doing this mom oh, conversation cool. with you. So he, he gets to decide what he wants. If it has ingredients that we don't have on hand, then he has to tell me ahead of time. But that's that's his thing lately. And um, he's really into pizza, but he makes it himself. He makes the dough and everything. So I, think I don't think there's good. anything wrong with pizza. There aren't bad foods. <laughs> that's right. No I bad. really like broccoli pizza. Mm. I, I really like, you know, that that seems like a fairly balanced meal. I've got cheese, I've got broccoli, I've got bread, you know, yep. Yep. it's not unreasonable. So <laughs> I feel like that's awesome. That's great. Including your kids in that, that really helps a lot. And uh, it gives them that ownership. Like Totally, totally. Right. And I, I think th kids thrive when we allow them to be as independent and as mature as they're capable of being. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and making those things and whatever. So, um, do you have any tips for us here in these last couple of minutes for making it all easier? Like, yeah, know, it feels feel like, like so much work. Right. And I think that the thing that I am still learning because I enjoy food so much and I want to just go Spend crazy all with your it. Time on it. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Um, but I also am finding that there's a lot of things going on in my life. My kids are getting older. I have more children than I used to. And so we're just, I'm just learning to simplify. Dinner does not need to be this really complicated thing. A turkey sandwich with some veggies on it. That is a balanced meal. There you go. 
that is our dinner some nights. And that's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, so I've been working really hard to compile a list of meals that I can make really quickly okay. and that are balanced, you know, my kind of magic meals. Um, that's something that's helped me a lot. Another thing that I do is I try to prep a lot of things in advance. So that could be, I prep at two at 2 PM instead of at four, whenever I have a, a slot in the day, sometimes it was in the morning before I went to work. Yeah. Right. But even just like cutting up the veggies that I'm going to be putting in my stir fry later, then when I go to make the stir fry, I'm like, Oh, half my work's done. This is nice. so much easier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I also prep things and freeze them. So I, I, have a vacuum cellar, which I'm obsessed with because it allows me to do so much of this. So I, I get a whole bunch of chicken from the store. I cut it up. Okay. Then I put it into portions that are one meal and I freeze it. And then when I want to make, you know, I want to make pasta, I pull out chicken, pull some, some, you know, mushrooms from the fridge and I'm ready to go. Right. And I don't have to, it's like one more thing I don't have to do. I also do sauces in the freezer. So my freezer right now, I've got pesto, I've got marinara, I've got, you know, that kind of thing helps. Um, and you can buy some of those things and put them, have them in your pantry, which I think is a really good idea. Awesome. Um, and you mentioned before that uh, sometimes we just feel like going to get takeout, but do you have a couple of recipes you can tell us about real quick about that's easier than takeout? Yeah, I have 100% decided that it is hard to eat out with kids. Takeout <laughs> takes longer to get than you think. If you are home already, the easiest thing is to make food at home, particularly if you're planning it. for it. So I do actually always have one meal on hand that is like no thought. So like frozen lasagna and a salad that that is something we do fairly frequently it when we're in a difficult time and less frequently when we're in a better time you know but I think you should always have a meal ready to go like that so that you can just pull it out and go um but I also have a couple that are you know my favorites to make I love making teriyaki chicken because I can just put I, I put literally it's like ginger soy sauce sake sugar put it in the oven with the you know for an hour and then I put it on rice or I can put it on noodles if I don't want to bother with making rice, which if you don't have a rice cooker is a huge pain, <laughs> or I can put it on rice in those little bowls that you buy and put in the microwave. Right. So it's like really easy and whatever veggies I have. Um, and I can do the same kind of thing with tacos where I can put whatever I want. You can put more veg types of veggies on tacos than you think. And I make up taco meat and then I have it in the freezer and I pull it out, you know, pulled pork is one of my favorites. So um, that's kind of easy. I'm going to put a whole list at some point on our blog. So you guys can watch out for that. All right. Yes. Because as I mentioned, she's a member of our mom of eight team and I'm so grateful for you. <laughs> now um, we're going to start sh uh, sharing our slides again. Um, let's see. Uh, Cause we've just been having this wonderful conversation and uh, we want to encourage you, our viewing audience, to take a moment right now to write down some of these key points that have stuck out to you personally. You can use the digital smile journal um, or um, you can use um, Oh, yeah. uh, let's see, you, but we, what we want is for you to write it down and make an action plan. Um, it's like the gear that we have, um, the bottom gear here doesn't touch the top gear, but by getting that gear going, then eventually it reaches out to, to some far impacting moments in our lives and, and one movement leads to another. So thank you so much. Um, for joining us and um, again the half hour has passed um, but it's so it's time to end our recording and start our live interaction with our viewers if you've watched this as a recording thank you and be sure to catch our live show every saturday at 3 p.m pacific time so you can participate also in the second half hour where we continue the conversation directly with you unrecorded we want to include you in the discussion. That's how Win Win Women TV is unique. We care, we connect, and we collaborate.